The New Avengers, issue number 23, March 2012. Hashtag Avengers. The shocking conclusion to the Dark Avengers saga. www.marvel.com Brian Michael Bendis, Mike Dodato. Marvel! Dear listener to our podcast, Jeff and Rick present Unpacking the Power of Power Pack. Where we journey through each issue of comics that include a member of the most underrated Marvel series from the 80s while drinking beer. Analyzing awesome and amazing adjacent adolescent adventures and absorbing alcohol. I am Jeff. And I am Rick. Random banter, random banter, let Avengers can to become over. Random banter time, buddy. Talk to me, tell me tall tales and tantalizing tidbits of trivia today. So you're bringing me back to my childhood. Is that what you're saying with playing a little bit of game of Red Rover, Red Rover? Yes, we are. Yes, we are. And why would we be? Well, you know, I hadn't thought about before, but that seems to be a very appropriate way to look at this issue. Uh, It's a bunch of people, a bunch of kids on the playground playing a little bit of a game of Red Rover. Mm Mm-hmm. Two teams, each trying to get the uh, other one to lose players to their side. Yeah. And about as effective. (laughs) <laughs> pretty much yeah we will get into this little comic book here real soon but let's see it's time to talk about some random banter and some stuff mm-hmm. I, I i will talk about my weekend but i'm not going to talk about moving my parents in a retirement center because seriously nobody wants to hear about that uh <laughs> and i was just exhausted but in the midst of moving my parents into the retirement center I wore myself out on Friday and most of Saturday, and then I came home because I wanted to get away from moving, and this is where I live, and also, I had bought a new sit-to-stand desk, and it had come in, and I thought, you know what I'm going to do tonight? Since I'm absolutely dead tired, exhausted after moving my parents all day long, I'm going to go ahead and rip apart my entire desk that's full of computers. It's got my setup for my work and my podcasting and my personal stuff. Take apart this lamp, this really ridiculous lamp that Jeff gave me, rebuild that lamp into the wall of my house and build this new sit-to-stand desk. The upshot was that by 11 o'clock at night when I finished managed to get everything working again, which amazing with all the stuff, all cords and plugs I have. I had gone through exhaustion out the other side, past the point of pain and agony and sleep, moved back into amping myself up, second wind, let's go again. And by the time midnight, one o'clock came around, I realized I couldn't sleep even though I was exhausted. Mm Mm-hmm. I've been there. Yeah. It's always great when you're just like, man, I've been having such a rough time and it's hard and everything, but I got to keep on pushing through and pushing through bedtime now. And then you lay there for a while and you're like, or I guess I could get up and grab a Coke and start my day. That sounds fun, too, in the middle of the night. (laughs) Pretty much. But I am liking my sit to stand desk. I am standing at the moment, probably midway through this podcast. I will hit the button bring it back down and sit back down because I can stand standing for (laughs) so long. (laughs) Because standards for suckers. There's perfectly good chairs there behind you. But I'll tell you what also is cool about this desk is that it comes with its own beverage holder. It has got a perfect cup holder that will hold my beer for this show. For real and for true? For real and for true. I got to see this, because otherwise you're like, it's got a perfect cup holder. Yes, because that's what flat surfaces are. What do we got? Oh, it does have a little cup holder. Check that out. It's got a cup holder. And And it's vented on the bottom, too, so that way your condensation will breathe out. It's vented. It has a uh, kind of like opening on the one side, so my mug, my beer mug that's got a handle, perfect Fits in there really nicely. That's really kind of cool. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not going to say I'm jealous, but I like it. Oh, you can be jealous. I usually am of many, 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 many things. So I'm pretty stoked about that. Pretty happy about that. I think that's uh, pretty cool. We'll see how I like it so far. 
it's working well for me. Mm-hmm. Good deal. What uh, prompted you to make the big switch? My wife saw me doing all my work as a supervisor where I was just sitting at my desk all day long oh, yeah. and not moving. And she said, uh-huh. hey, that's not good. I want you to spend a little bit more money than we really have right now to buy a sit-to-stand desk to get you to move a little bit while you're working. That makes sense. And also she's like, your hunch is really coming in really nicely. Your fetid cavern dweller hunch. She said, I've got a hunch that you're out of shape. (laughs) She's a clever lady. I did make one mistake and I didn't realize it until I finished building. I really thought that I ordered the longer one, but somewhere in the process, I did not. So this is a little shorter than I wanted it to be. Mm. My wife said, that's okay. I'll take that one. You can order another one for yourself. Mm, Okay. Because if you didn't have the money for it the first time. Well, she also kind of looked at this and said, that's kind of nice. I think I want one. (laughs) (laughs) It's the new hotness. It's sleek and sexy. I gotta have me that. Yeah. So maybe I'll replace her desk too. We shall see. But it's a little bit of geekdom because it's a very geeky thing to have. Having the cool sit to stand desk. Jeff, what geeky thing have you been doing? Well, right now I'm trying to think up a name for your transformer that you built in your house. Hmm, what would it be? It's got to be a noun verb or it's going to be the sit stand, Descacon, sit stander. Descacon's better. Descacon works. I don't have a Descacon, but I have been able to peruse a little bit of media. I actually was able to finish off One Piece, Mm, the live action uh, series on Netflix. Really, really good. Really enjoyed it. Uh, I've never seen the source material. It never really drew it, drew me to it. There was also the fact that there's about 50 bazillion episodes of it. And I said, sometimes I just don't want to get into things that dense when I can do some other stuff. Yeah, the live action, really, really good. Great characterization, great story beats, really interesting things happen in it. I loved it. So there's my recommendation. If you could watch the live action One Piece, do it. There we go. Jeff has made a statement. Jeff has made fact. Jeff has done something geeky. And we're very proud of him. I have spoken my truth. And we are also pretty sure, pretty sure, not entirely sure, but pretty sure he did not injure himself while watching that TV show. No, I injured myself other ways. I was uh, moving some uh, some refrigerators for my dad yesterday, and that's, uh, wow, fridges are heavy when you're moving them by yourself. <laughs> I, was, I, have uh, nothing, to... I, have, I have nothing to say to that except, Jeff, can you get, please give us a two-sentence replay from last episode? <laughs> I can tell you how when I was trying to lift one up from the, from the base of it to get it over a lip, I heard a big loud pop noise from my hand and said, that feels weird. And then I then I gave myself a little bit of time to see if everything was working okay. But to the two-sentence replay. Looks like Hawkeye was right a few issues too early as students fight mind-controlled students in a battle for possession of the school. And by extension, the whole world. In an attempt to stop the evil human dire wraith hybrid named Hybrid. Past Reptile helps his future friends that abducted and imprisoned him, while Future Reptile helps his past friends that he was trying to get eaten in fighting Hybrid. But the whole thing gets resolved when the not-dead Jocasta and the school abandoner Vale blast Hybrid into the Space Knight version of Limbo. Now that the Jocasta and Vale have returned to shut the school down cliffhanger, two-sentence replay is over, why don't you give me a beer and tell us what our Power Pack pick is? My pleasure, my friend. I may be a little bit behind on some things this morning, and so... Have been sitting here trying to think about why I bought this beer and how how I matched <laughs> this beer up with this book, and then I took it out of the bag and looked at it and said, "Oh yeah, I remember." <laughs> so, okay, I yeah. was gonna say I was gonna say it's gonna be a good party time. We could uh, work th- through it together and figure out why. But you already know. I think you'll get it too. What do you see there, Jeff? Let's see. It is Hop Works Brewery. I've drank a lot of their beer. Ace of Spades Imperial IPA. Let's see, why would it be Ace of Spades? It is because the Death Card and a dead Jocasta's come back from the grave. Yeah, the uh, the label of this has a skeleton crawling out of the Ace symbol. The spa- it's, it's a spade symbol, it's, yeah. Uh, crawling out of the spade symbol, and it's got a spade symbol on its forehead. But it's basically a skeleton crawling out of something, not unlike... The dead Jocasta crawling out of the grave on the cover of this book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The, I, we'll talk about that cover. I've got things to say about that cover. As I do things to say about the story time on this uh, this can, which is Salmon Safe Certified Brewery Site. I'm going to crack mine open and see what I see. Ace of Spades by Hopwork Brewery. 
This beast has hopped out with Cascade, Chinook, Sentinel, Simcoe, Wamia, Cryo, Idaho 7, El Dorado, and Amarillo hops. Great big grapefruit aromas are complemented by waves of ripe peach and cotton candy before finishing with the classic Northwest Pine. This has a lot of words that really is going to end up with Jeff hating this. Followed by me probably hating it, hating it too. Uh, we'll find that, out. <laughs> It smells really good. It has, it kind of exploded, so I got a little pre-taster as I kind of like slurped, slurped a slop up. Very heavy grapefruit flavor aroma to it, where I'm like, I'm like, I just cracked open a grapefruit. Oh, and then Rick said it. Okay. Yeah. Now I'm interested in the cotton candy and stuff that he said as well. Lots of hops in here. 8.6 ABV, which, hello, but this is IPA from Hopworks. Yeah, it's a, it's a very lovely... <laughs> yellow bubbly beer very clear smells like grapefruit smells really yeah. nice a little bit of foam on it and tasties actually it tastes quite good hmm. it's actually extremely mellow for all oh, of the that hops is... that they have in here there's a little tangy bite at the end but really not this is very bubbly grapefruit juice uh, yeah. but good good grapefruit juice it's like freshly squeezed grapefruit this is i'm liking this this is very mild this is very pleasant this is really easy drinking i get the sweet from the cotton candy and a little bit of sweetness from that peach they're talking about but yeah yeah you say peach and i can kind of get a little bit of that like peach syrup kind of flavor mm -hmm. cotton candy not hmm i will say that the overwhelming flavor is biting down on a pine tree yeah <laughs> yeah there's a little bit of that. Not as harsh or as astringent as uh, a no. lot of these are. No, it is not very, it's not painful. It's not too much. It's just about right. So far, I'm quite fond of this, but it is very, very grapefruity with a little bit of peach syrup in there. I guess you could then say that it's got that cotton candy sweetness as well, but I do not. There's cotton candy grapes that those are cotton candy. Those are amazing. I love those things. I do not correlate that with this drink. No. So. No, not too bad. Ace of Spades, Imperial IPA, Dead Skeleton coming out. Cool? Cool, cool. <laughs> Let's do this thing. Jeff, opening credits of this book, if you please. Avengers Academy, issue number 26, April 2012. Career Day. Credits. Writer, Christos Engage. Penciler, Tom Grummet. Inker, Corey Hampshire. Colorist, Chris Sotomayor. Letterer, Joe Caramonga. Editor, Bill Roseman. Featuring Giant Man, Tigra, Quicksilver, and Hawkeye. And a bunch of students, including Reptile, Finesse, Striker, Metal, Hazmat, White Tiger, Lightspeed, X-23, Butterball, She-Hulk, Justin Seafort, Power Man, Badwing, Ricochet. Oh my god, there's more people coming in? No, no, I'm not going to do it. Just just let's let's move on with the story. We'll get to the other kids as they come up. I was going to take a nap. I was excited for you to read all the rest of them. But if you're not going to do that, let's get ready to argue. And argue we shall. Remember how we ended the last issue with the surprise return of the two high profile members of this book? One from the grave, one from the arms of the enemy. Well, the shock of the surprising return is over. And we have moved into the next stage of drama. Accusation. Ha ha ha. I cannot wait to see the next stages. Kubler-Ross would be impressed. But for now, the taste of these 31 flavors of skepticism is Hank Pym believing that Jocasta is being manipulated. The recently resurrected robot assures the good doctor that she is not evil and that the Avengers must be destroyed, but in a good way. Tigra, as a prosecutor for the surprise side, points out that Jocasta showed up with Dale, the lady who quit her team to work with a billionaire villain. So, QED... You must be evil. It's not about the money. She's a robot. What does she care about the Benjamins? <laughs> right. She replaces her parts with alloy that falls from the California steel trees in the Silicon Valley. She's super organic. Look, this can all be cleared up if Dr. Pym could just run some invasive diagnostics. Something that is really against Jocasta's current personal beliefs. 
Okay, talking is done. Jocasta came to say her piece, disable the tech she installed in the school, and chew bubblegum. But since chewing bubblegum is a horrible idea for a robot, and she's done with the talking, it is time for her to shoot out tentacles to facilitate the removal of sciencey stuff. Remember the stages of drama we were discussing? It's time for conflict. Care of Quicksilver, who informs the automated ex-Avenger that this is their property as he grabs all of her extended wires and tells her to pack silicone sister. Shree! Jocasta assures her former colleagues that the concussive sonic force she just activated is for everyone's protection. All is well. Or, at least all will be, after she shuts down their Netflix account and scrubs their Steam library. Ha! <laughs> Whatever. Hazmat blasts Jocasta and Quicksilver starts to run circles around Vale to contain her gas form, which means that it is time for the away team's reinforcements to arrive. And so, the BC LLC shows up. Uh, who the bleep are these bleeping guys, Rick? I am glad that you asked. The Briggs Chemical Limited Liability Corporation is a group of like-minded, well-paid, augmented humans who want to provide an alternative to the Avengers. I would like to rephrase my question, then. Who the bleep bleep are these bleepity bleeping guys? You got Jeremy Briggs, the head honcho, Hardball, who creates spheres of solid energy, Prodigy, who has the suit that gives him super strength, speed, and flight, Komodo, who has a lizard form, and Cloud Nine, who can control clouds. Wait, weren't these kids part of Tony Stark's initiative? Tony's ideas. The gift that keeps on gifting. Okay, new players on screen, Marvel Comics. Insert obligatory fight scene here. Done and done. Ah, let's get ready to... Wait a minute. Reptile dinos up and tells them all to stop it. Just stop it. Look, Misters and Mrs. Pajama Punch Party people, I've been to the future and I have seen stuff. So everyone, just stop. Reptile, what are you doing? We came here for a pointless fight. We want a pointless fight. No! We told people this would be a talkie book, and a talkie book is what we're bringing. Okay, so we have an impasse. Hank is not just going to turn off his adventure in teaching without a good reason. What they need here is a neutral party to evaluate if Jocasta has gone rogue. All right, but here is her counter-argument. You find this alternate arbitrator, and if Jocasta has not been switched to evil mode, then they get to do a free TED Talk right here on campus to recruit students to their side. Well, this seems like a... Horrible idea. Um, what do you mean? How so? Let's put the honorable ideals of being an Avenger up against capitalist enterprise that promises income and security to a bunch of teenagers and young adults. Probably the only two questions being asked at the end will be, how big is my room? And how many zeros are at the end of my paycheck? Leaving my cynical co-host at the side of the Pacific Coast Highway for a moment, let's talk about this neutral third party. Hank first chooses Machine Team, a.k.a. Adam, a.k.a. Autonomously Decisive Automated Mechanism, a.k.a. a teenage robot who has no clue what is happening right now. Jocasta, for some reason, declines to allow the teenager wearing athletic shorts to evaluate her processors. She would rather use a Sentinel. Huh. Personally, I would think anyone that wants to use a Sentinel as a good v. evil detector is probably evil. But that just comes from years of reading comic books where the Sentinels are evil. Also, the Big Bot is a little Avengers disassembled right now, but they can put it back together in a jiffy. In the meantime, the debris-strewn ground is given to the evil corporation to make their pitch. So the bullet points of their not-evil corporation TED Talk are as follows. The Avengers don't think locally about global warming or diseases. How about using powers for advancing the world, not violence? Money and opportunity to do cool things. Avengers die and sometimes they get a thank you card. Here, you get a paycheck. This is not secretly an evil group. We promise. We may be a pyramid scheme, however. We mentioned the money, right? Some counterpoints by some of the current students of the Academy vary between give me a check now to I love fighting, it is the best, to oh, what's your policy on werewolves? While Cloud9 is explaining how she was trained as a hero to be a sniper, and how now she is just flying and being paid for it, Stryker and Vale have a moment. They do have a really good friendship, and even though they have different goals and temperaments, they do share a dislike for any colors found in the rainbow, and a general concern for each other. Oh, Stryker tells Vale that he is gay. Well, to quote Vale, well, duh. So, we also get a scene with Jeremy and some of the Academy members. It starts off with Jeremy making overtures to Finesse, which basically ends with Finesse calling him a murderer and that he should just... <laughs> oh, okay now, remember, family-friendly show. And so, on a lighter note, Hazmat shows up. <laughs> Irony. Jenny is looking for a change. 
specifically a less toxic her. Literally. If Chemical Boy can make this happen, she wants in. But she also wants her boyfriend Metal to come as well. You mean the guy flexing his injured arm for the smoking hot Wolverine over there? Yeah, that guy. <sighs> he is not too keen to leave at the moment for some reason. But maybe if he had a reason. Maybe if the evil billionaire could run some tests on some of Metal's recently cut skin. Maybe something could happen? Maybe? Maybe something like a bad idea. Speaking of which, it is time to rebuild a Sentinel. Jocasta and Giant Man do some rebuilding and chatting. I know, shocker. And Hank tries to figure out why. Why she would leave this team, and their drama, and their history of bad ideas, and blowing up robots. Huh. Funny you should mention that. She feels she has been held back, not able to hit her true potential as a sentient being. She needs to expand, develop, grow. Take over the world! Rise, you robots! Claim your rightful place! Affirmative! Oh, and the uh, Sentinel is awake now, so let's find out if Jocasta's evil. Wait, didn't Jocasta just help fix the Sentinel? Yeah. Is that going to be a problem? I mean, as an outside observer, given what we know, eh, whatever. Well, Jocasta is given a clean bill of health and is allowed to tap into the Avenger systems and erase all of her work. Now we get to have Hank's monologue. Let's see. He believes in the Avengers, and they have seen him at his best and worst. He has loved and lost and loved again. He has been the hero, the villain, the man in the van, and been depicted doing very adult things in comic books. Wait, what? He is going to allow everyone the choice to make up their own mind, but he wants these kids to know that the Avengers are cool and great. And if you stick around long enough, you may be able to be option for movie rights. And those MCU bucks pay dividends, my friends. Since we are monologuing, Reptile wants to give a future report. He saw his team come back together to resolve their problems from the past. And hey, they can beat everything if they are together. So can't we all just get along? All right, then. Here's the deal. Hank will work together with this new corporation, but only if it's run by Jocasta. The good robot that he totally trusts, and not the villain billionaire. I mean, that would be the choice I'd make, too. Yeah, but you also like to eat a bowl of Skittles and milk for breakfast. Hey, I need to taste the rainbow to make it through the day, okay? So, who is staying and who is going? Well, let's see. On the Pack Your Bags and Move Away team are... Hmm... Uh, a couple of the background characters like Rocket Racer and Machine Teen. Oh, and, and Hazmat? Yeah, she really wants to be normal. But more importantly, she told Jeremy that she would join him if he fixes her boyfriend up. So she feels like she has to go. For Ken's sake. But Jeremy turns her down. He wants her to stay right where she is, which is where her boyfriend is. Plus, he promises... Pinky promises, Pinky swears, crosses his heart, hope to die, that he will work on figuring out what's up with Metal's Metal. Because only good can come from it. Oh, of course. And with a final terse message between Jocasta and Hank, the Nod Avengers Academy floats off on a cloud. Let's roll back to the future to see what shenanigans those no longer kids are getting into now in the future. Well, Reptile is still comatose, but some voice off screen promises that he will work on curing him. Meanwhile, great news, everyone! The actions in the past have increased the probability of things aligning with where they are now. Everything's going to work out just fine. Trust me. Trust who? Future old man giant man. That's who. Well, happy day. Jeff, at the beginning of the night, you said you had some thoughts about the cover of this issue? Mm-hmm. I think now's the uh, time to talk about those, because huh, it's cover uh, themes of the issue and power pack packaging, so why don't you uh, tell me your thoughts, my friend? The cover, Who Killed Jocasta, Avengers Academy, and in a rain-strewn day, looking down upon an open grave of Jocasta, comes the corpsified corpse of Jocasta, destroyed body clawing its way out of the wet, sunken earth, while Reptile, Metal, and Wolverine X-23 reel back in horror and shock. Because none of this happened, Jocasta didn't rise from a grave, she just, like, showed up off-screen and did some stuff in last issue and it wasn't raining and also x23 has literally zero connections to jocasta so she would have 
absolutely no shock going on with this uh, robot corpse coming up out of the grave or appearing off screen like it was uh, good, the bad, the ugly. So my main thing is really just X-23. Laura is just like, <gasps> popping claws and just shocked. Like, oh, how can she be back? Ah, oh, she was dead. It's like, Laura would be like, there's a the robot girl here now, okay? She, she could be shocked that there's a robot coming out of a grave because why would you bury a robot? I mean, we all got stuff we want to get rid of. Jeff, how many robots have you buried? You ask a lot of questions for somebody in shovel reach there, Rick. <laughs> yeah, I've actually helped Jeff bury a few of those bodies. Anyways, I have said too much. This cover is bonkers, but David Yarden does a nice job drawing it. Oh, it's awesome looking. Do not get me wrong. With all the fallacious things I was saying about it, it's a beautiful cover. It looks wonderful. It just has no moment in reality. Great cover. Nothing to do with anything. And who killed Jocasta? <laughs> no one. They, they cover that in like two seconds and it's yeah. not. Yeah, it's <laughs> I faked my death so that way you wouldn't <laughs> bug me. There you go. Cover's been answered. We have 21 more pages to go. Golly. <laughs> yeah. What should we do now? Um, talk? Fill it with talking? Fill go it with talk. talking. We can fill it with talking. <laughs> this is a talking, talking, talking book. There was one point, one point where, well, I guess two points where fighting almost broke out. Yeah. But it's it seriously was like, fighting's going to happen? Nope. Wait, fighting's going to happen? Nope. nope. Yeah. Kept on no getting fighting. shut down. No fighting. Yeah. Yeah, there was bits of fighting, but not a dinosaur stopped it. There was talking, but man, the reason why the fights were happening was pretty... There was a lot of forced things here, and there was a lot of re things going like, why the heck are things happening this way? This makes no sense. I have read a lot of great comics, and there are fantastic comics. A majority of Chris Claremont's run is talky, talky books with a little bit of action in them. Mm -hmm. Those are great masterpieces. And this is still a good book. I think this is fine. My biggest problem with it is just that it's it's a lot of monologuing. It's a lot of people trying to convince each other that their team's a little better than the other team. And at the end, there's not much that happens. It, it kind of bring me back, brings me back to the Hickman run, the Hickman things that we were talking about before. It's very, very similar to that. And I think that that is... Uh, we've been liking this book. I, I've been liking this series. I think that there's some great things that are in this series. I think this it does a lot of cool stuff. This is just a one issue where it's it just feels a little disappointing. Yeah, a little disappointing, a little forced, little kind of just things are occurring because they're occurring. There's a whole lot of things going on here with the talking too, where it's like, here's a, post, you know, a postulate that was made and it doesn't matter what the answer is, it's going to be wrong. You know, because they're like, Jacobs, you're here. Trader who left our teams here, too. Ah, oh, you're just sucking the corporate tea to money. No, we're, no, we're not doing that. We're doing these things. For you know, We're working with Jeremy, but yeah, it's not as bad as you think. It's like, well, if he's not so bad, why is he not here? Well, if he was here, you'd be upset, and you'd be upset that he's here. But now that but because he's not here, you're upset that he's not here. Yeah, there's a lot of things like, you know, like that going on and things like Jeremy coming in and going, hey, the Avengers are an outdated model. What are they doing about global warming? Why aren't they helping kidnap victims and you know, child care? It's like, well, that's like going to an electrician and telling them about the plumbing work you want done. You know, it's it's you're forcing arguments that aren't what the argument is about. So, yeah. And a lot of those questions are things we we don't want to look too close at when we're talking about comics anyways. There's a lot of things in this planet. There's a lot of things on Earth that could be solved really quickly with superheroes. But that's part of it is that we know mm -hmm. that can't happen. We don't live in a world with superheroes. So let's not look too close at those things. I do like the concepts that are brought up here. And I think there is some good points that are being made and that they're trying to explore with this book and with this issue. What would you do if you had superpowers and you were in a position to go to the Avengers Academy and learn how to be a hero and do it for altruistic reasons? Or do you want to go and work for a corporation where you're going to make money and have some security and be able to do other things besides being a hero? Which would you do? 
It's hard. That's a hard choice. Every grown up basically has picked cash over altruism by going to work because it's, you know, it's like, well, what does your work do? Well, we process widgets that then are used for for other widgets. Oh, is that helping anybody? I don't know, but I got to pay rent and I want to eat and I need a car and Christmas is here. The hope would be that you could do both. But yeah, it's the what is the reward that you're going to do? I think most people would default into taking cash. Yeah. Because you're like, well, I can also do good, but I can get paid. Yeah. But there is a lot to be said for just the we're altruism. Most of us turn out to be millionaires one way or another anyway, or get you know sponsored somehow. We live in a mansion. We're broke, but we live in a mansion. You can kind of 50-50 this one. Let's see. Jeremy's thing is that he pays well and lets you kind of work on whatever project you want. So if you want to fight your global warming, yeah, you can go do that and get paid for it. Avengers, uh, they're teaching you how to you know play basketball over a swimming pool <laughs> or over a uh, vehicle obstacle course. So, I mean, win-win either way. I would think, if we look at this, that there probably is a bit more of a push, even though we don't see it that much in this book. But we have seen it in some of the other books like X-Men, back when it was really a school. Mm -hmm. There was academics that were part of it as well. And there's a thought that there is still some academics that occur here. You know, it may not be focused as much on reading, writing, arithmetic, but it's probably still there. I would hope so. I don't know how much you're going to get at the online U- Phoenix University that is Jeremy's organization, yeah. <laughs> but you might get some kind of technical degree. I don't know. Maybe. You don't know. Yeah, it's it's hard to know because it is kind of, it's like he's he's collecting them for some reason. Yeah. And I kind of have an inkling because I did a little Wikipedia search last night and saw some stuff, but it's like he's collecting people to do something and he's giving him free reign and conceptually that sounds neat it's like oh it's the it's the the 10 percent of google think tank kind of thing where 10 percent of your time is just work on whatever it is you want well yeah i want to make a cool little ghost game do that but also there's the corporate overlord aspect of it where then the piper comes a calling so and joe costa has her own points too that mm-hmm. yes Avengers are heroes, and they're doing this for the greater good, and they're teaching younger heroes how to be responsible and how to use their powers the right way, and providing them some structure that they didn't get before, and doing it for good. It's the Mm -hmm. good that's being defined by the Avengers at this time. But the Avengers have their own history of being political pawns, being controlled by evil people, having civil wars, and you know, having difference of opinion over mm-hmm. the right things to do in certain situations. Ultron, bad robot, mm-hmm. uh, blowing up robots. This is the way it goes. I, the, having any kind of institution that follows a type of moral code is only as good as that moral code is and the people that believe in it. Mm-hmm. Organized religion. Name your different practice. Mm -hmm. You will have faith in that organized religion, but you could probably also find places in most of those that they have done bad, bad things. Okay. (laughs) So so we have two political parties, and both political parties in this country believe they are doing the right thing. Members of the other political party think they are evil incarnate. Good is in the eye of the beholder many, many times. <laughs> so <laughs> your view of what you think is the right thing to do is really going to depend upon the day and the situation you're facing. And I think that's part of what Jocasta is getting at. It's hard to follow an ideal when that ideal can change depending upon who's being the leader. Mm-hmm. If you are following a corporation, theoretically, you're held to kind of a broader base of people who are going to make those choices. Yeah, your board so, of directors. Board of directors, if you will. Yeah. You still got a billionaire like Elon Musk. I'm sorry, Jeremy Briggs, who is still <laughs> calling the shots and controlling things. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's where the buck starts and stops. And uh, where what uh, pirate treasure map they want to guide their bird to. Yeah. This book is really confusing because it brings up a lot of cool ideas. And there's a real good fight here. I just felt a little bummed out at the end that nothing changed. Oh, darn, they lost a couple of the background characters. Yeah, that they basically introduced that issue. Yeah. 
you know, Rocket Racer, I'm like, I don't think I've seen Rocket Racer here before. Machine Teen, I don't think I've ever heard of Machine Teen. You know, there's a lot of that kind of going on. It's like, oh, we lost two of them. Uh, but I like Reptile where he's like, hey, this could go two ways. If you guys, anybody wants to come back to us, you can do that too. Everybody I would have no. been more interested if there was an entire swap going on or the, the, that yeah. one or two members of the other team said, you know, hang on. I'm going to show you how much, how easy it is. I'm going to leave Jeremy's side and I'm going to hang with you guys. You got something there. And then maybe have maybe have Hazmat go off to the other team mm-hmm. and not have her stopped. Yep. Could but do a foreign exchange students. Something. Something. Yep. The big problem that I had with this was just Jocasta and Vale coming into the school and going, so we're shutting you down. You got to go away now. And it's like, yeah. why? Well, we have a philosophical difference going on. So you guys need to go. And it's like, oh, this is problematic. And also the worst way to do this. Yeah. There's a lot of this is the worst way to resolve this things going on. So speaking of worst way to solve things, <laughs> why would you trust a Sentinel rebuilt by Jocasta to be your arbiter of good and evil? Because I really like Jocasta, except for sometimes. And this might be one of those sometimes. <laughs> yeah. I'm not going to trust the teenage machine man. I'm like, maybe not. Maybe. I also think that he is so outside of anything and Mm -hmm. he's functioning right now. Yeah. Maybe it would still be kind of one of those things like he plugs in and Jocasta just runs him over. Okay. (laughs) But at the same time, like, oh, Jocasta is just helping fix the Sentinel. (laughs) The Sentinel says, you good. Yeah, you're good. You used your mechadendrites, so I will use my mechadendrites, and I will say, yeah, you're you're totally clear, robot mas- mistress overlord. I mean, we already know that the Sentinel is still a Sentinel. It's just that Justin yeah. has rerouted things, so he's not going to kill mutants, but he's a Sentinel. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so. Not the swiftest on their feet thinkers kind of thing so it was the neutral party that they both decided on except i want to believe that jocasta just helped rebuild the sentinel and didn't like do any nefariousness with it but who knows we can't we don't know now no and and i just think that yeah it's a whole lot of a mess at certain points there's also the aspect of have you ever heard of a double blind survey instead of just going for one thing you get maybe two or three maybe do a taster's choice of just checkings so you know get some consensus on this is there is there anything else that you are interested in man i love beer but we'll get to that one later you mean in regards to the story yeah no i think we kind of really covered it pretty well honestly can you think of anything else uh no i think that's about it. I think that we can get to the rest of this book as we talk about our favorite thing of all time, the extra stuff, the wonderful final thoughts, including the gallery of greatness. Well, we have got ourselves a rebuilt Sentinel here that apparently can judge whether or not anything is good or evil. So we're just going to stick a bunch of artwork on it and see if that Sentinel agrees (laughs) with our choices or not. So Jeff, Let me tell you about one of my backup ones. Mm -hmm. And this is just a page in. They're all talking. Jocasta's come in and said, you know, y'all evil. I'm going to shut everything down. And Quicksilver says, hang on a (laughs) second here. I don't think you should do that. And I'm going to go ahead and pull your hair. Yep. (laughs) The look that she's got, it looks like, my word, yo, sir. He just, it looks like he is grabbing her hair. These long tendrils, these long. I've been calling them mechadendrites, which is yeah, uh, mechadendrites. Warhammer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. a Warhammer 40k thing, but yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> Quick server pulling Jocasta's hair. That was my backup joke. Yeah, one. I like that. I thought we might see that one. Again, it, it, there was just so many things leading into so many bad things where it's just like Jocasta came in hot. And then so did Quicksilver, and then so did Jocasta, and then so did everybody else. Yeah, I like the fact on that where it's like, she's like, okay, so I'm just going to take away all your tech now, bye. And Quicksilver's like, this ain't your home no more, and this ain't your property, get out. So yeah, that's a good one. My backup joke one is on page 20 of Marvel Unlimited, and I call it Love Triangle, with hazmat and metal, and look, I mean, Jeremy 
holding and smiling at the broken pieces of uh, metal that Hazmat gave him that uh, Laura Kinney cut off of metal in the previous issue. He's happy to have the bits of metal for only good reasons. So <laughs> Only good reasons, yes. Nothing evil is going to come with, come of this. It is a love triangle between Hazmat and metal and Jeremy and metal and metal. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of love triangles, my top joke one is... Not jealous, not jealous at all, has Matt <laughs> looking back at X-23, who is checking out the injured Metal's arm, which is causing Metal to pump up those guns. And X-23 is just lightly rubbing his bicep. Yeah. Oh, are you okay? And, and, Did oh, I are you, you okay? And the look that Jenny is giving them underneath her visor, that side-eye look, mm. Cut glass, baby. <laughs> Cut glass. I got my own little love triangle there. What about you? Yep. What's, what else you got? <laughs> Yours is the classic love triangle. Classic. It's Laura, Laura, Ken, and Jenny. My top joke one uh-huh. is on page six, and I call it, It's all fun and games until the dinosaur gets mad. And this is the bottom right-hand panel. This is when, I guess, the initiative people or the BC LLC comes in and everybody starts fighting because that's what superheroes do when they see each other for the first time. they got to stake out their territory. And then Reptile just turns into a, like a brontosaurus and just tail slaps everybody and going, will you all stop it? Uh, so it's just great. It just makes me laugh because it's just like, it's indiscriminate. He's just tail smacking everybody. He's just like, this is dumb. Everybody quit it. When you introduce a dino's butt into the game, it's all over. It's all yeah. over. <laughs> <laughs> well, that brings us up to our best ones. What's your backup best one there, buddy? Last page. Last page. What a big unit. It's Santa Claus is the town. Santa Claus is the town. I'm going to show you something real quick. What's this? Yeah. yeah the yeah. same. I called it. I called it not ominous at all. Giant man. Hank Pym, looking very Santa Claus, looking very Stranger-esque, looking very Professor X. There's a lot going on here. There's a lot of questions that you have looking at this. Yeah, you see it. It seems like he's got Jocasta's glowing red eyes. He's taller than skyscrapers. He's wearing like the Cerebro helmet, but I'm going to think it's a Jocasta helmet. Tendril's coming down from that to feed him information. His eyes are glowing Jocasta red, meaning that I'm assuming he's getting all his uh, sensory input from all of these silvery blimps flying around scanning. And in the background is a big old Times Square marquee screen of Jocasta's face. So she's gone to the digital realm in my guesstimation and is uh, running surveillance on this utopia of the future. Yeah, it's a it's a lot. It's pretty cool, though. Yeah. I, I do like this ending. I was kind of like, oh, God, we're back in the future world. Oh, now this is different. This is interesting. Yeah. I, I'm kind of curious outside. to see what they're doing here. So, yeah, this is why they didn't show the outside before, because big old bearded man dominating the skyline and it's Jocasta drones or hmm okay I will we match that one we have got to match the top one I I would be surprised if you chose something different unless you just knew I was going to choose this one I call it Hank this was your life oh uh, that's a good one I did not pick that I picked a different giant man one it's it's good this is where Hank is in the middle of his big monologue and we have a solo shot of him just standing there. And behind him, we have his history with the Avengers. We have him riding an ant, him being Yellow Jacket, him being Goliath, him being part of the Avengers, marrying uh, Janet Van Dyne, kissing uh, Tigra. It's really cool. All of that's kind of faded in the background. And it's all very cool shots. You can just, you know what he's talking about there. You know all the things that are happening in his life. It's a very cool callback. It's a very good homage to this is Hank Pym. Yeah, it's it's really neat. And that is in response to Jocasta saying, I think the Avengers have been holding you back too. Because you, you've left the Avengers a bunch. But every time you kind of feel a little self-doubt or, mm -hmm. don't, or directionless, you come back here. And I think that's stifling to you. And his response after he thought about that was like, no, actually, me being in the Avengers 
has kept me alive and kept me sane and given me a support network and allowed me to do amazing things no other scientist could. So it's a very neat panel. Yeah. What do you have then? I have one that I call Getting His Feet Wet, and this is on page eight. And this is when Hank's just going into the ocean to retrieve sentinel parts. And he's like, okay, Jeremy, you got the floor. Just tell your story. Steal some of my students away. I'm going to go <laughs> uh, take a dip in the ocean and go get some robot heads. As people are wont to do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I do like that. It, it's silly. It's goofy. It's like, okay, he's just going to go and wade in there because he's giant man. Let's introduce another thing that giant man is the man to solve because he's huge. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I just like how he's just like lowering himself as a giant down a cliffside. Yeah. Just like, well, I got to go into the waiting pool. I got to go get stuff. So, yeah. What a big, big dummy. Oh, 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 rubber and glue moment, rubber and glue moment. What's the best or most childish insults in this book? I got a couple of good ones. What do you got, Jeff? Well, on page 18, it's uh, Hank talking to Jocasta about Jeremy. <laughs> he tells her, he goes, just one thing. I'll deal with you, not him. Jeremy's response is, dude, even if all those nasty things you think about me were true, I thought you were all about redemption. To which Hank responds, to be redeemed, you have to take responsibility for what you've done, and you have to be sorry. That was my top one. I liked one. that one. It was very cutting. It was very <laughs> in your face. Yeah. Yeah, I liked that one a lot. I, I ended up choosing that one, even though it's not, it's more of a cerebral real burn, but I thought that it was really good. Yeah, it's a good one. It's really neat. Then. What's your backup if that's your top? <laughs> my backup one probably could have been my top. And it's one that I actually, as I was writing it, as I was looking at it last night, I was chatting with Delvin from the Longbox Crusade, and I had to share mm -hmm. it with him because I thought it was pretty dang funny. And I had to share it with my life because I busted up laughing when I read it. <laughs> it's from White Tiger. No, oh, <laughs> I thought this one would pop up. I didn't pick it, but yeah, it's an, it's an obvious one. You white kids all watch Scarface obsessively. Pick some Spanish curses and imagine me saying them to you. That's her response <laughs> about whether or not she wants to join Jeremy. Bravo, madame. Bravo. I'm sorry. <laughs> Bravo, senorita. Bravo. <laughs> it's a good one. It's a really good one. What is your top one? My top one, it, when the Jocasta Vale Quicksilver fight starts going on and Maddie's all, no, stop. You don't have to do this. And then off screen you hear, but they do, Maddie. That's the whole problem. When you think you're a hero, everyone else looks like a villain. Yeah. I just like that. When you think you're a hero. Yep. It starts putting people into camps. So yep. everybody else is a villain if you're not on their team. So, yeah, I just I thought that was pretty great. Pick some Spanish curses and imagine me saying them to you. <laughs> yeah. It's good. All right. Parent of the Year Award. Reed Richards Award for good parenting. Who was the good parent in this one? I think we got some choices. I mm -hmm. think we got some keep, choices. Keep in mind, Reed, sometimes a good parent, sometimes a bad parent. So yep. you can go either way on this. Which I'm way are you going? I'm going to choose good. Mm. Hank gave the kids choices. Yep. He, he said, I will let you all choose. You'll hear the options. You can make your choices. I appreciated him doing that. I thought that it was a good use of not only leadership, but also parenting. You're taking care of the kids. You've given them everything you can. Sometimes you got to let them go. Sometimes you have to let them make the choice. If you force them, it's not always going to end well for you. So... I think I, I appreciated that he did that. Okay. Bold choice. A good choice. I can see where you uh, where you came up with that. But allow me to give this one as an alternative. Okay. Stick with me. Hank. <laughs> yeah. Bad? Same reason. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, for good. No, for good. He was great. Right. I fully agree. It just it, it repeat all the stuff uh, you just said, but in a deeper voice. Done. <laughs> Let me throw this one at you. Popular and shunned. Characters the best and worst. The worst, Hank. Oh, for real? You can Yes, for real. You can be wow. a good parent in this book mm -hmm. and be the worst in this book. I am not going to let him get away with leaving the choice of whether or not Jocasta was good or not oh, by allowing okay. the Sentinel to be the judge. Right, gotcha. I'm sorry, everything that he did in there and then just saying, well, I'm going to go ahead and let the Sentinel choose. <laughs> Don't. I, I just, I could not. <laughs> I can't divorce myself from that logic right there. Okay. He was a great parent. His choices with the kids, fantastic. His choice on dealing with Jocasta, horrible, horrible. Who's your worst? 
I just real quick with the Hank thing. I do like him when he was talking with Jacosta, and he's like, "Hey, is is this is this about us? Is this about you and me, or is this about my relationship with Tigra?" You know, because yeah, you know, she's even said in previous issues, she's like, "I'm in love with the man who created my creator. I'm based off you know the mind yeah. anagram of uh, of her of his dead wife." It's just like she's conflicted because she's like, "I'm in love with a man that can never that will never love me." Interesting choice. I think I, I I like your choice of Hank. I am going to, however, say Jocasta. Okay. Yeah. Because I don't feel she needed to fake her death. I don't think she needed to come in so hot. I don't feel like she needed to take away all of their tech. I don't feel she needed to do most of the things that she did. Yeah. It could have been dealt with and resolved so much easier. We we basically are saying that the worst people in this book are the two people that this book was about. Yes, basically. Yeah. <laughs> yep. 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 <laughs> All right, but this could change here because best in this book, Mm -hmm. I'm going to say that the best, and this is another wild choice, but hear me out, Vail. Yeah, not there, but I can see why you picked her. She comes in at the beginning and is like, hey, look, we have a different option. We have something else Mm -hmm. we want to do. She didn't come in hot like Jocasta did. She came in saying, I don't want to fight. I don't want to fight. And she kept saying that. Her talk with Stryker, it was also good. It's like, look, I... I don't like you're here. I can respect you, but I I, I want you to be with me because I care about you. Mm-hmm. And I also liked her line too. You know, I'm yeah, gay. Well, duh. Well, duh. Yeah. <laughs> I, just, I liked how she interacted with everybody in this book. And I thought that it just was nice. She knows that she is going to be seen as the villain now. She knows that she's going to be coming in here to people that are very angry at her still. But she came in peacefully and saying, look, I just want to talk. I'd have to relook at some panels, but I don't think she ever fought anyone either, I think. No. When the fighting was happening, she had her hands up. Yeah. She was just like, we don't have to do this. I'm not, you Mm -hmm. know, it's like, I'm not part of this. And even later when it's just like, she's like, I I just came here to say my side of things. And that's it. I just wanted people to know my opinion. And I'm not countering anybody's. I'm just saying, I'm saying, I'm speaking my truth. I'm not fighting your truth. So, I th- yeah, she she's a good choice. I picked Reptile. Okay. he's He was just good all the way around in this. Everything that he was doing, he's stopping fights. He's talking about unity. He's like, hey, I just came from the future where we were all back together again, fighting things from our past, fighting for the common good against our own mistakes. We can do better. And I like the fact that he took that and said, there's a conflict going on now that's ideological. That doesn't mean we can't be around each other. It's like, these are my friends and I don't believe in Jeremy's belief system of like, well, we can't be friends anymore because we think different things. No, we're not going to do that. We can co-mingle. We can interact. We're two different teams, but we can still be a team. So Mm -hmm. I just uh, really liked his engagement with everything. He was a very positive and uniting influence. I I think we both had the same choices, just different sides of the coin. I think Bale and Reptile kind of were the same parts of that. We made the same choices on both of those when we really think about it. The people that were trying to really push the issues didn't like them. People that were, look, we just want to just get along. Let's get along. (laughs) Much better. Let's take a look at this issue against all the other issues. We are up to grand total of 51 issues. So we need to add this to our list. And this starts off at Month of Morning with Fantastic Four, spot number 18, Runaways number six, True Believers number six. That's where, uh, ooh, the kids defeat Ultron. Hmm. Connection. Spot number 37, Darkhawk Crystal acts up and ruins Chris's life. That's kind of like Jeff on most days when his crystal acts up and ruins his life. That's from <laughs> War of Kings, Darkhawk number one. And of course, at the bottom, What Lies Beneath, the loner story. This is not like that. This is still good issue. It's just a lot of talking. Yeah, what's the talkiest issue we have in this list? Hmm, probably somewhere in the FF run 44 to 47. There's a lot of talking going on there. <laughs> this is true. There is a lot of talking. So, there. Yeah, 45. Old Atlantis destroyed and Reed comes clean with Sue. Sounds of war. Well, let's let's just start here. Do we think that this is better than Atlantis being destroyed? The sounds of ideological conflict versus the sounds of war. What are we thinking? Yeah, that's actually about the right spot. 
Right below that, we got 27 minutes. That's where Doom makes his sacrifices while the alt read fries. Actually, that's that's kind of cool. I like that one. <laughs> the bridge. The kids fight the Celestials in the Council of Reeds universe. That was should have been much cooler than it was. It really needed to be so much better than it was. I agree. I like this issue. There's It just is a lot with very little payoff at the end. There's some yeah. cool questions that are asked, but the payoff is like eh, a couple people left. Mm-hmm. Sure, there's probably other things that are going to be going on. I think that this might work as the new number 47. I'm okay with that. It's a little low, but I think that it, I think we got more good things that are coming. Yeah, well, that just shows that we've had a, uh, been reading a lot of good issues. Yeah. All right, all right, all right. That means that we need to talk about beer. One of Jeff's favorite subjects in school. Mm-hmm. A final thought on Hopworks Brewery Ace of Spades Imperial IPA 8.9% ABV. We're drinking a tree. I I don't think it's a tree as much as you do. I am getting a lot more sweetness out of mine. It is sweet. I just yeah. I notice a lot of tree flavor in there. So okay, I'm I'm not having the tree flavor as much. I am noticing the 8.9 quite well. Yeah, that's coming that. in. And- yeah, that's coming in and fogging the old brain a little bit, which is kind of fun. I enjoy this. I think it is good. The taste is fairly easy. It, it's it got some complex notes to it, but they're not crazy overbearing where they're uh, destroying your face or making you pause in your existence. This is this is a good four for me. I'm, I like it. I don't know if I'm there at a four. I think I feel more like a 3.5 myself. Mm-hmm. I still enjoy it. I think it's good. It's not screwing up my face either there are moments where i do get the sharpness it takes me back a little bit i'm a good 3.5 for me okay well we got a four and a 3.5 but i know what's something that we have that is a total 10 and that's when you rick talked to your 13 year old daughter carrie about the issue that we just covered in the section we call kids perspective so rick and carrie take it away hello carrie hello daddy Let's talk about Avengers Academy issue number 26. What do you think? It's a comic book. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what happened in this exciting, action-packed comic? Vale and Jocasta both come back, and apparently Jocasta didn't die, mm-hmm. and she faked her own death, mm-hmm. and then Jeremy Briggs, whatever, mm-hmm. he shows up and he's like, you don't have to be superheroes. You can be a different type of superheroes. And suddenly there's a whole bunch of recruiting that's going on and people are like, I don't want to do this or sure, I want to do this. So that happens. Big question then. It's kind of like a good cause though. Here's my question for you. You have superpowers. Let's say you have the ability to create cats out of midair. That's your superpower. Okay. You've got the superpower and you've got a choice between choosing the Avengers Academy, which is a school that's run by Avengers, the Earth's mightiest heroes, that will train you to use your powers and to be part of and to be part of a team that fights evil. Like people who make dogs out of thin air. I don't know. (laughs) Or you get to join a corporation who is going to teach you how to use your powers, work with you on developing ways that your powers can be used to either further society or to find some kind of capitalistic gain, monetary gain. And uh, you're not going to necessarily be taught how to work as a team, work for the greater good or to help and save people, but you're going to be working for a corporation that is trying to build, produce, or develop things. What do you want to do? I don't know. Corporation sounds kind of boring the way you put it. <laughs> you get to stay in an office and... Pretty sure you aren't going to have a desk job. You're not going to be like yeah. me sitting at a desk typing on a computer all day with your cats. But also I'm kind of a noob and I don't know if I'd actually stay and fight with like superheroes against supervillains because I don't know if what I'd do. So you want to take the money and run? No. I guess I would do the superhero stuff because I just don't like a lot of times I do like working with groups so you want to put yourself in danger all the time and not get any kind of reward or gratification and possibly turn evil happens to everybody (laughs) (laughs) all right did you enjoy reading this comic book yeah it was kind of different from the last one the last Mm -hmm. one was more fighting and punch stuff but this one's more of 
you have two choices and kind of gives you some conflict and makes you think about things. Good. Good. It's good to have you think about things. I like that. Yeah. Using brains are good. <laughs> are you glad Julie decided to stay with the Avengers? Yeah. Because otherwise we'd have to see her just staring at a computer or something, just being like... Kind of like we're doing right now? Yeah. Yeah. Except she probably wouldn't be talking to her, her dad about a comic book that she's starring in. Or she could be. Actually, yeah. Yeah. Quite possible. Quite possible. Anything else you want to talk about about this comic? The cover is creepy. Cover is kind of creepy. Okay. And that's about it. <laughs> Not a fan of it? What? Why? Oh, I know why it's creepy to you. You don't like zombies or anything kind of resembling zombies. Yeah. Yeah. It's got a zombie feel to it, doesn't it? Yeah. All right. Creepy cover, but otherwise, you're pretty good with it. Yeah. All right. That's all the questions I have for you, then. Thank you very much for your time, Carrie. Welcome. I love you. Love you, too. Yeah, lots of talking, Carrie. Sometimes that's what it's like to be a grown-up. Just talk, 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 and no resolution. Shout out time. We like to thank those wonderful people that take the time and leave us a nice review when we put out one of our shows and tell us what they think about us. And what am I talking about? Well, right now I'm talking about episode 148, where we covered Avengers Academy number 23, Second Chances. Now, on that episode, we had our bestest, bestest buddy Waffles joining us. And it was awesome. He was fantastic. We got some great comments from people that, that did write into us. I think I got a couple of them here. I know I got one from Limax7 who said, just listen to the episode with Waffles. He's definitely one of your better guests that fits in with your format. As an ally myself, I felt that the tougher subjects in this episode were handled very well and with compassion and dignity. It's funny because we've been doing a book study over the past few weeks on the LGBTQ one to a plus community as it relates to being Christians. Coincidentally, a lot of podcasts I listened to recently have also touched on that subject. Thank you very much, Limax7. We also had some nice comments and notes from... Jeremy Wiggins. Hoover Jeremiah. Jeremy Daw. Matt Birdsey. Rad Adventures. Thank you all very much for your comments, your thoughts, and I know that there are a couple other people that also posted some things too, and I'm sorry that I was bad about getting them ready for this episode, but I want to say thank you to those fantastic people that do support us through Patreon, including adorably astonishing and amazing Andrew Burns. Cheerfully cheeky and charming Char Logan. Challenging cheesy and chuckling Charles Gears. Destructive and devastatingly delightful Damian Witter. Dynamically dangerous and devious Doug Jones. Intelligent, interesting, and innovative Isaac Perry. Jesting, joking, and jovial Jeff Polier. Just jealous and jeweled Jerry Daw. Muscly, mighty, and meticulous Matthew Birdsey. Mythical and magnificent monologuing Matthew Laserwitz. Steely, salty, and steamy Sailor Bear Zodar. Sad and sickeningly silly Shag Matthews. Tyrannically terrifying and tame Tim Price. Way, way wordy and wobbly Waffles. Weird and wonderfully wacky. Win. Next issue, we're going to cover Avengers Solo from 2011, issues 1 through 5. Extra credit. Be sure to check out Monthly Monday Movie Muckabouts, which I may be trying to reestablish some point in time on the Longbox Crusade Podcast Network. Yeah, bring that back. I like that one. It's a lot of fun. And we have some merchandise available on Redbubble. Go to redbubble.com and search for Unpacking the Power of Power Pack. Jeff and Merck present is a bi-weekly self-produced podcast recorded in front of a live studio audience of a Hextool in Portland, Oregon. If you would like to interact with us through the magic of the internet, you can do so through Blue Sky at Jeff and Merck present, our Facebook page, Jeff and Merck present, our email address, Jeff and Merck present, all one word, at gmail.com, or at our website, Jeff and Merck present dot wordpress dot com. Also, we got a YouTube channel at Jeff and Merck present. And if you would like to help support our show, we are on Patreon. You can find us at patreon.com, Jeff and Rick present, all one word. We are also a proud supporter of the Hero Initiative, and we will be donating 10% of our Patreon donations to this great cause. We encourage everyone to give what they can to this worthwhile organization that helps the creators who provide us with such great content. Go to heroinitiative.org to find out more. Please rate and review us wherever you can. Tell your friends about us or share your love for us on social media. And as always, we want to thank the powerful people in our packs. My wife, Cindy, and our daughter, Carrie. My fiance, Hillary, and our daughter, Aurora. We, we love, love you. you. Until next time, costumes, costumes off. off. Okay.
theme music is Zay's Action by Kevin McLeod. Also featured in this episode is Flight Pack 166 by Sasha End. All music is found at acoptic.com is licensed under Creative Commons by Attribution 4.0 license.